So uh, before I start talking about the reading for today, I wanted to just say a little bit by way of preparation for the reading for Tuesday. Um, uh, so the reading for Tuesday is on Canvas. Um, and uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in it, but what I mostly am going to focus on is, well, two things. Number one, how the strict verificationist uh, view of the Aufbau starts to get adjusted um, as logical positivism goes on. And number two is the difference between Carnap and Neurath. So, uh, like the difference in the way they think about what this project is, what language is, etc. I mean, you'll see that that's uh, a lot of what's going on in these readings. And um, and just uh, one other thing, which is this this term or this phrase in English. protocol sentence. So the readings for last, last uh, for next time are uh, basically involve a dispute between Carnap and Neurot about the nature of protocol sentences. So uh, um, first of all, I want to point out that the protocol sentences are already mentioned in the Aufbau. Um, um, this is section 101 on page 159. Um, this is about the language of fictitious constructional operations. And um, in order to be able to apply the indicated fictional separation, we have to assume a further fiction, namely that the given which has been experienced is not forgotten, but that A retains it in his memory, or that he makes a protocol of it, since otherwise there would be no material to be synthesized in the second part of his life, right? This is according to the fiction where this subject, A, um, well, that's weird. I'm using the wrong camera here, aren't I? Hold on a second. That's better. Okay. Um, but I'm going to switch back to this anyway. This, this fictional subject, A, is supposed to spend the first part of their life just having experiences, and then the second part just, you know, like using the basic uh, fundamental relation to construct all the objects of science on the base of those experiences. So, um, and Carnap is saying, well, we have to have this further fiction that in the first part of their life, A doesn't just have these experiences, but makes a record of them, or protocol. So what protocol means, I don't know if it can really mean this in English so much, uh, Although you do hear it, for example, in the title of that book, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a, a protocol in this sense means like um, uh, a notebook in which you take minutes of a meeting or record what happens in a lab or something like that. So a protocol sentence is the kind of sentences that would be written down in the protocol of... In, in this case, the again, it's the assumption is that the subject of the given makes a protocol of what is given or what is epistemically fundamental. As we'll, as we'll see, Carnap starts to change his mind about you know, what kind of things should be in the protocol. But um, in the uh, Aufbau, the sentences that would go in the protocol would just be sentences involving the fundamental relation and basic experiences. Okay, so um, that's all in preparation for, for the reading for next time. Are there questions about that? 
Okay, and I guess I do want to say one other thing about the reading for next Thursday, which is that it's relatively long and technical. Um, and I'm warning you in advance because I maybe even want to start it in advance. Most of the technical details actually are not going to be that important, but still it might make it hard to read. Um, okay, so now back to, to today's reading. Um, okay, so remember at the beginning I wrote down these three issues, right? One was... Um, uh, I'm going to say them in the opposite order that I wrote them down to begin with. One was technical stuff. Another was, what does this have to do with science? And finally, what I wrote first before is, what's up with this book? <laughs> um, so I've spent uh, probably more time than uh, you would like talking about the technical stuff. I have said quite a bit about what it has to do with science, but I'm going to talk about that again, but only really in connection with that final one. What is up with this book? What, and what do I mean by that? Well, you know, Carnap says a lot of things here. Um, and um, number one, they don't all seem like they're important for the purposes of some single project. Um, um, I mean, sometimes I guess it's even clear that it's kind of a digression, but it's not absolutely clear what is digression and what isn't. Because he's interested in all kinds of things and he remarks on them as they come up. Um, number one, but number two, because there's various pieces here, which some of which he's only interested in for the sake of others. Although in another context, he might be interested in them for other reasons. Um, and to some extent, some of the things he's interested in even kind of conflict with each other. Not in the sense that there's an inconsistency, but at least in the sense that uh, if you were really, really interested in one of them, you might leave out a lot of the stuff that is relevant only to the other one and vice versa. Um, and uh, by the way, one of the suggested paper topics has to do with this. So you can pay attention to that. Like, you know, is Carnap in the Aufbau talking about X because of Y or is he talking about Y because of X? <laughs> um, and there's material to make conflicting arguments about that in this book. Um, okay, so I'm going to say something about the best I can tell what at least some of the answer to that is. Um, that is, I guess, the question being, what's the main point? <laughs> what's most important to Carnap that everything else is brought in for that? purpose. It's, you know, this is also relevant to paper topics for another reason. You know, when you finally write a paper and if you finally write a paper, because right, you have a choice between paper topics and take home final in this course. So actually probably not that many of you write papers, but write papers in other courses. And you know, when you write a paper, part of the, the problem is making sure there really is one thing one purpose, and that everything else in the paper is there because of that purpose. You know, so like one way to do that is to have a thesis and to have that thesis be the last sentence of the first paragraph, you know, uh, even more rigidly, and then make sure that everything in the paper goes to prove that thesis. But there's lots of other ways to do it, right? The main thing is just to do it and usually to make it clear to the person who's going to read it that you're doing it. Sometimes you don't necessarily want to do that, at least not to all readers, and that something like that may actually be going on in Carnap. Um, uh, when you're handing in something for a grade, usually you do want to do that. 
<laughs> um, but uh, you know, if you're a philosopher publishing a book about politics and God and science and whatever, maybe sometimes you don't want to do that. Like you, know, you want to make it obscure, at least to some readers, what your main purpose is. Anyway, um, sorry, that's also kind of a digression, uh, although it's probably more important than what I can ever, ever I can tell you about our nap. <laughs> but in any case, um, right, so what is the main purpose here? Um, so you might think, um, and I already talked about this and dismissed it before, but I'm going to go into it again because it's so important. You might think the main purpose of this book was either idealist or perhaps nominalist. That is, that the main purpose was to show that the names of almost all objects are merely abbreviations. Or in other words, as Carnap puts it, that almost all objects are merely quasi-objects. And... Um, um, and that therefore, all we ever really talk about or know about or have anything to deal with or have any th reason to say exists or whatever are the basic experiences. Right? So that would be like and one way of, of taking all of that, one direction of taking all of that, that would be some kind of Barclayan idealism well, or maybe more than Barclayan idealism, solipsistic Barclayan idealism, right? Where, um, where what I end up proving is, it's a good question about Barclay, why he isn't a solipsistic Barclayan idealist or whether he isn't. But anyway, never mind that. So, um, uh, so that is the moral would be that nothing is real except my basic experiences. Or in another direction, it could be it could be a form of nominalism, where I say that um, all there is besides basic experiences is speech or something like that, names. Um, and uh, so there, you know, there are things in the book um, that make it seem like Carnap is going in this direction. By which I mean, in other words, it's if you if someone were to read the book and think that's the direction Carnap was going in, that wouldn't just be a foolish misreading. They would have things to base it on. Um, one, uh, oops. one especially uh, strong text that would take you in that direction is one that I didn't assign. It's in section 162, um, where um, Carnap introduces an analogy or a parable, kind of, about stars, stars and constellations, and um, how, you know, um, it might seem like when you talk about the constellations, you're talking about something other than the stars, but all you're really talking about is the stars and, and some fundamental relation between them, right? Like their apparent position, you know, uh, distance from each other in the sky or whatever. Let's see if I can... Um... The analogy of the stars, that is to say, the second case with the property of the stars, which were connected only through relations, right? That is, he discusses two cases. One is the real case where the stars are all different brightnesses and colors. And so, like, a lot of what you say about the stars has to do with the properties of individual stars. But then he considers a second fictional case where all stars look identical, 
And so the only thing you can say about them, only things you can say about them are about their relations to each other. Right? There, there are two stars close to each other in the sky where there's a third one farther away in this direction and so forth. Um, so that's what means the second case. So the analogy of the stars, that is to say the second case with the propertyless stars, which are connected only through relations, gives a good picture of the intention of construction theory. All objects of the empirical sciences, except for the elementary experiences themselves, which are correspond to the stars, are constellations of stars, together with their relations and connections, which are formed from propertyless but orderable stars. Right? So the basic experiences, together with the fundamental relation, give us this domain of propertyless objects like these propertyless stars, but they're propertyless, but they're orderable. We know some relation that they stand in to each other. Um, and if you take that analogy at face value, I think you would say, well, you know, are there really constellations in the sky? Well, in a sense, yes. I mean, that is, it's not nonsense when we talk about them. Um, but in a better sense, no, they are really just stars in the sky. And constellations are just some way we decided to arrange them. So, right, that tends in the direction of if for stars you substitute my basic experiences, then I would say, you know, are there uh, sense qualities? Are there external physical things? Are there other people's psychological states? Well, in a sense, yeah, it's not nonsense when I talk about them. But in a better sense, no, all there really is is my own basic experiences and the fundamental relation. And again, I, like I should, before I go any farther, this, I want to warn you that this is not what I think is the right answer, but I'm still giving evidence for it. <laughs> Right? That is, I'm saying, what things would lead you to think this? Well, there are things about the book that would lead you to think that. Why am I giving you evidence for something that I think is the wrong answer? Well, first of all, because I might be wrong, I guess, is one reason, you know. So then you should know the evidence that, sh in, that it's against me, because maybe you'll decide I'm wrong. But uh, also because... You know, as I often say in every course like this, whatever the point of it is, it's not for me to know exactly the right interpretation of Carnap and somehow zap it into your brain. Because even if I somehow, even if I did know the exactly right interpretation, which is ridiculous, and I could somehow zap it into your brain, which is also ridiculous, you wouldn't remember it. <laughs> right? So that can't be the main goal and I think you know a, a more important goal is to like show you an example of someone dealing with a text like this and trying to figure out what it means which is also why I don't apologize too much for digressions and changing my mind in the middle of a sentence and whatever because if the goal were for you to know, you know, for the rest of your life, how I, th what I think Carnap means in the alphabet, all those things would be counterproductive. But that's not really the goal, right? That wouldn't be a reasonable goal. Um, it's not what you're paying for, presumably. I don't know what you are paying for, but I know that I'm being paid and you're paying. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm being paid to do something. Um, all right. Anyway, um, that was a digression about digressions. Let me get back to the text. Um, so, um, you know, here's something that was in the assigned reading that uh, would make you, might make you think this about the alpha. Um, this is the thing about Zeus at the end of section 167 on page 268. To pose the psychophysical problem from the vantage point of the heteropsychological would be very much like the following. Somebody has accustomed himself 
to envisage an angry Zeus whenever he hears thunder. By the way, at some point later in this reading, Carnap mentions that uh, myth as a type of a use of language that stands between science and poetry that um, that traditional metaphysics might perhaps belongs to the realm of myth. <laughs> um, okay, but anyway, here we're not talking about myth in that sense because the anger of Zeus is constructible. That's the whole point, right? Someone has accustomed himself to envision, envisage an angry Zeus whenever he hears thunder. Eventually, he poses the question of how it could be explained that Zeus's anger and the thunder always occur simultaneously. Right? So the, the, so the, um, analogous case, again, here is supposed to be that, I mean, envisage, I don't know why he puts it that way, actually. I think you should say, I accustom myself to use, well, maybe, yeah, so maybe that shows where the metaphysician starts to go wrong and how the scientific use of language becomes mythical. I accustom myself to, I mean, what I first do, or what I, if I'm doing it right, what I first should do is define in use the term Zeus such that the sentence Zeus is angry can be replaced by the, the sentence, I hear thunder now. Um, and that will be a good logical translation. It will preserve the truth value. Right? So every time uh, I say Zeus is angry, it's always also a time when I would say, I hear thunder now, and vice versa. That's the first step I take. But then I have certain associations, certain images, or Vorstellungen is the German term he would use. Um, there's certain images I associate that are different between these two sentences that have the same logical value. And with the one that says Zeus is angry, I imagine this angry guy throwing lightning bolts or whatever, right? So, you know, so maybe that's what misleads me into doing this silly thing. But anyway, it is silly. I start to say to myself, wow, what a coincidence that um, uh, every time I hear thunder is also a time when Zeus is angry and vice versa. What could explain that weird coincidence? <laughs> and that's when I start um, doing metaphysics, trying to answer the essence question about this relation. But it isn't a coincidence, right? Because to begin with, I defined Zeus as angry, or I defined Zeus in such a way that Zeus is angry has to always be true whenever I hear thunder is true and vice versa. So there is nothing to be explained here. So that's the analogous case. And what the analogy is supposed to be to is the psychophysical problem, which is um, where I say to myself, how can I explain that every time um, um, or sorry, what, sorry I'm, I'm not filling in the whole context. This is, what it, this is what it would be like if I posed the psychophysical problem about other people's um, psychological states. Well, okay, so actually maybe I got the connection to myth and metaphysics wrong. I, I'm not sure, but anyway, so this is what the analogy is supposed to be. The psychophysical problem about other people's psychological states would be... Um, Wow, it's such a coincidence that every time someone else feels anger, their brain does certain things, and vice versa. Every time their brain does those things, they feel anger. What could explain that? And I would want at this stage to already start bringing in these metaphysical theories like, oh, well, brain states are 
the same thing as psychological states or one causes the other or whatever. Um, but actually, it was silly to do that because if you look at the details of the constructional system, you'll see that psychological states were constructed on the basis of brain states or were constructed on the basis of bodily movements, which um, there's physical laws that connect them to brain states, right? So either way, it's not a, it's not a coincidence. The, 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 the second way, if the construction actually worked by way of brain states, like at some higher level of technology when we could do that, let's say, if the construction actually worked by, by, by way of brain states, this would be exactly like the Zeus case. I accustom myself to saying X is angry whenever I look with my super brain scope into X's brain and I see it doing a certain thing. So I define X is angry, or I define the property is angry, in use in such a way that X is angry can always be replaced with um, X's brain is doing the following things. So there's nothing to explain about why those two always happen together. There's, you know, what he goes on to say is that there's more appearance anyway of something to explain or of a question when I'm talking about my own psychological states, but I'm not going to get into, get into that because all of this was by way of getting back to, well, you know, so is it right or is it not right for this person to say, whenever I hear thunder, Zeus is angry? Well, in a sense, it's right because they defined Zeus's angry to make it right. But in another better sense, it's not really right. Because it's just a weird way of saying I hear thunder. <laughs> right? I mean, um, uh, it's a myth. So this also, although it's not, I think, as strong as the, as the thing from section 162, makes you expect maybe that Carnap is going to say in the end, yeah, our, my belief in physical things and other people's psychological states is kind of like um, uh, a Anyways, whether there really were such people or not, I'm not sure, but a supposedly very naive believer in Greek mythology who uh, just, uh, um, so the joke about this in Aristophanes, the clouds, is that when Socrates convinces this ignorant old guy that uh, thunder is caused by clouds bumping into each other or something like that the old guy says wait really and uh, do you mean to say that rain is not zeus pissing through a sieve <laughs> right so and it's a joke in aristophanes because yeah who i mean right well anyway so the point is like uh yeah you might think that the point is to say that my believing that there are external physical things is like believing that rain is Zeus pissing through a sieve. <laughs> it's something that's understandable in a certain way, and maybe you can make a certain sense out of it, according to which you could even say it's right, but basically it's a mistake. <laughs> okay, so that was a lot of time spent convincing you of what I think is wrong, maybe too much, but any anyway, note, now I'm going to remind you why I... I argued before already that this is wrong. Well, um, um, if this were right, then what is uh, most important in the book would be that Carnap has chosen the correct basis for the constructional system, namely the basis of the things that really exist or that we really talk about. Right? Like, it wouldn't make sense for Barclay to say, um, yeah, well, for some purposes, we should say that the only things uh, that words can stand for are ideas, 
But for other purposes, it would make more sense to may, say the only thing ideas stand for are bodies, corporeal substances. No, I mean, it's really important that there's a big difference between those two. Um, uh, number two, what would be really important would be the so-called ascension forms. Right, namely cl the class and relation extension that are used to build things up at higher levels from the things at lower levels. Um, that is the fact that we've chosen them such that they allow um, um, not only translation but uh, elimination of the higher level entities. Um, uh, that they allow us to regard everything on a higher level as introduced by definition. You know, um, um, that, you know, I mean, it's unclear to me how, how fundamental Carniap thinks that is in the Aufbau, but, but he seems to end it that we could, we could need others maybe. If we needed others, I don't know actually, but then if we needed others, we couldn't do what he calls reduction. But in any case, what's more important is that we, the ascension forms would not only have to be those particular ones, but that we would have to be able to eliminate them in such a way that we got, that we um, uh, backed up this theory of strict verificationism. That is, we would have to be able to eliminate them in such a way that once they're eliminated, what we would end up with is sentences that can be made true by a finite number of my basic experiences that I could actually check in principle. Because again, otherwise, like, um, you know, I can't accustom myself to saying Zeus is angry every time an infinite number of conditions that I can never in principle check hold. So I can say a sentence that lists all those conditions, but it won't help me um, get rid of the sentence Zeus is angry in favor of that sentence in this idealistic or nominalist way, unless the sentence I'm left with is something I could actually check. Um, otherwise, you know, I have a habit of saying that Zeus is angry and I'm willing to accept this other sentence as a translation, but my habit can't be based on checking that translation is true because I can't check that translation is true. Um, so, so, um, all of this would be crucial to the Aufbau project if we understood it that way. And lastly, so I guess, you know, maybe I should write up here. Is that still on the screen? No, it's not. This would be crucial, this would be crucial, this would be crucial, and it would be a necessary outcome that I could do this, policing science. Is that readable? I'm looking at it. Anyway, let me look at it on the real. I guess, I mean, you know, my handwriting aside, I guess it's readable. All right. <laughs> um, so, uh, the necessary outcome of this would be that I would be able to use the system to police science. That is, uh, I would be able to take any purported scientific statement and test to see if it was really scientific by translating it back into a statement about my basic experiences, seeing if I could do that. If I couldn't, I would know it wasn't science. Um, 
that it, you know in other words this this whole procedure would mean s starting with things that i know i have a right to say and figuring out whether other things that i want to say can be reduced to them or not um um so I think, you know, there's no doubt that there's something to this reading, historically speaking. I think Carnap was attracted at some point, either before he wrote the Alpha or even, you know, because remember, he started writing it before he came to Vienna and then he talked about it with other people and then he finished writing it. So I think at some point, either before he wrote the Alphau or during his work on the Alphau, he was tempted towards some kind of idealism or something like that. Um, and it's possible there's even some traces of that in the book. But um, by the time we get to the Alphau, as I pointed out before, Um, number one, he says that the choice of basis is, um, um, informed by the results of empirical science. So, uh, um, If you were really trying to do this idealist thing, there would be some kind of weird uh, circularity, but um, um, wrongly accepted premise in this reason, right? Like it would be as if, as if Descartes in the second meditation said, you know, well, can I doubt that I exist? And then the answer was, well, no, because uh, like I looked it up in a scientific journal and it says that human beings exist. <laughs> right? That would be no good <laughs> because at that stage, I'm doubting the existence of scientific journals. <laughs> right? Um, and, you know, I mean, even more so, if they do exist, I'm doubting their authority. So, right, similarly, at this stage, if Carnap were to say, well, look, let me try to figure out what really exists and choose, choose the basis that way, um, it wouldn't make sense to say, okay, well, let me just ask some scientists what they think. I mean, in, in a word, this project would be what people, I mean, well, this is dangerous. People do weird things with this term, but anyway, this project is what people call foundationalists. I would be looking for the true foundation on which all knowledge or even like uh, belief of reality uh, stands, and it wouldn't make sense to ask empirical science to help me out with that. Um, uh, another thing that's clear in the Aufbau as it stands is. Um, and this goes in the same direction, that my constructions are supposed to be rational reconstructions of the results of empirical science. Um, so we can't use them to police science. On the contrary, I have to ask science, what kind of objects do you think exist? Um, and, uh, then, you know, the test for my system is, can I explain what those objects are? Um, it's a certain rhetorical, yeah. I mean, you might ask me, okay, well, why does Barclay try to convince us that uh, what he's saying doesn't go against common sense? That he can give a good sense to all the things we usually say. Because otherwise people won't accept his system. 
but why does he want other people to accept this? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Actually, these things are kind of complicated, but um, okay, well, actually, so let me add one more piece to this which I think makes it clear that whatever reason Barclay has for doing this, it's not Carnap's reason, which is that um, Carnap says this is a test for um, any constructional system, and there's good reasons to adopt constructional systems on other bases. We're doing this for one reason, but for another reason, the physical basis might be better. So, um, the point is not to show that a thesis of what's real and what isn't is consistent with what people usually say because you want people to, um, you know, here's how it might go, even if you're a solipsist. You want people to believe what you say because they'll say nice things about you and you know from experience that people saying nice things about you is associated with pleasure. <laughs> so, uh, um, but that wouldn't explain why um, uh, you want to be able to do the same thing with a completely opposite metaphysical thesis like materialism. What there really is is particles and fields or something like that. Um, so for all those reasons, besides, of course, the main reason, which is that Carnap comes out and says that constructional theory doesn't conflict with idealism or realism in any, res in any meaningful respect, but only in the meaningless realm of metaphysics, um uh for so for all those reasons i you know i don't think anything like this is what carnap is mainly up to in alpha he does want to show that a verification of system is possible but not because he wants to show that um uh all the things we ordinarily ordinarily think of or all the things that I ordinarily think of other than my own experiences are mere abbreviations or, um, uh, you know, con convenient ways of speaking for my own purposes. So why does he want to say this thing? <laughs> First of all, are there questions about anything I said before I go on? I know I kind of, and I know I have a tendency to do this and I'm sorry, I already said why I think in some ways it's better. <laughs> that I have a tendency to start second-guessing myself as I talk about something. Uh, it would definitely less be less confusing if I just, when I thought something like this, just didn't say anything and <laughs> hoped you didn't notice the problem I just noticed. But it would be less confusing, but um, worse. <laughs> I think. So anyway, are there questions about what I just said? Because if not, I'm going to go on to say what I think is up with this book. Um, okay, so let me start with this. What is so bad about metaphysics? <laughs> what is... What is wrong with metaphysics? Now, I guess I should, to begin with, say that in the Aufbau, as opposed to in some of the later works, it's not always 100% clear that there's anything wrong with metaphysics. Sometimes he says things that make it sound like he means uh, there's a division of labor between science and scientific philosophy on the one hand and metaphysics on the other hand, right? So he says this question is not one for science, but for metaphysics. Right, you know, and there definitely are philosophers who hold a view like that, you know, like Leibniz, I think, is probably a particularly clear example where physical 
science has and all the special sciences have their own realm in which they work and in which you can do good work without knowing anything about metaphysics. Um, but then there's this other science of metaphysics that has it also has its own realm, but is more fundamental in certain senses. And, you know, so an important thing to do when someone proposes a question to you, like, you know, um, how is it possible that one substance can affect another, is to ask yourself, what realm does it belong to? Right? And if, you know, so Leibniz will say, well, that doesn't belong to the realm of physics. Um, that's metaphysics. So physicists shouldn't worry about it. <laughs> right? So sometimes Carnap sounds like he's saying something like that. But I think even in the Aufbau, if you pay careful attention, you'll see that uh, metaphysics is not just another thing you could do besides science, but that there's something bad about it, and we're trying to overcome it. Um, so what is bad about it? Well, um, not, of course, just that it isn't science. I mean, the reason I say, of course, is because Carnap takes on or describes a view like that in section 183 and um, says, well, but that's not our view. Um, Right, this is in context of the discussion of whether construction theory is um, rationalism. And he says, well, it's definitely not rationalism as opposed to empiricism. But then he asks, well, is it rationalism as opposed to irrationalism? Or as opposed to thinking that, you know, reason is limited? And he says, no, it's not. We agree that limited reason is limited. Um, this is on page 297. The task of cognition is a definite, well circumscribed, important circumscribed, important task in life, and it can certainly be demanded that mankind should shape that aspect of life which can be shaped with the aid of. Oh no, actually, I should have read up here. Hold on. The proud thesis that a question is in principle uns. Sorry. The proud thesis that no question is in principle unsolvable for science agrees very well with the humble insight that even after all questions have been answered, the problem which life poses for us has not been solved. Right? So he's saying, you know, um, uh, what science can do, that is, answer every question. Right? So again, like, when he says certain questions belong to science and others belong to metaphysics, he means the real questions belong to science and the pseudo questions or apparent questions that aren't really questions at all belong to metaphysics. So, you know, uh, science, that is that activity can, which can answer every question is important, but it's not enough. Um, we have other problems in life that can't be solved by knowing something and knowing the answer to a certain question. And for that, we need other things besides science. Um, so what's bad about metaphysics in particular, apparently, is that it, is that it has pseudo questions and pseudo answers. That is, that it looks like science, but it isn't. Um, right, so, um, for example, he talks about this on page, section 176 in page 284. 
Um, I didn't mark this. Oh, that's two ninety four. No wonder. Here it's okay. Metaphysics is the extra scientific domain of theoretical form. Theoretical here means as a, not as opposed to observational, which is the way Carnap um, is going to mostly use the term theoretical later on. Theoretical means as opposed to practical, right? The original Aristotelian or Kantian division between theory and practice. And what he's saying is that metaphysics is the region of language where it seems like we're saying things that are either true or false. It seems like we're trying to make a contribution to theory. Um, it has the form of that, but it really isn't because it's extra scientific. I don't know why I'm freezing like that. Because it, it's extra scientific, which we know is going to mean that it doesn't really have any true or false statements or any questions. Um, because a question is a statement together with a proposed task of telling whether it's true or false. Um, So what is allowed outside the realm of theory is, uh, or, so in other words, what's bad is something that is not theory, but looks like theory, uh, like pseudo-theoretical. Whereas, and if you look back at that section I was just reading, 183, about rationalism, you'll see that this is exactly what he says there. The, the larger problem of life that we can't solve just by knowing something is not a theoretical, but a practical problem. It's a problem of what to do. Um, and um, the answer to a practical problem like that is what Carnap calls um, and so it usually gets translated here as attitude. The German word is Haltung. Um, Haltung, I mean, it's, it's, uh, Halton is, is a cognate of the English verb to hold. And, but Haltung means like how you hold yourself. Like the attitude, you know, literally attitude means like angle, right? The attitude in which you hold yourself is your halting. Um, so uh, um, the answer to a practical problem is a certain attitude. That is, it's a certain... Um, uh, way of responding to the practical challenges of life. I'm going to this open and so here, this is from section 181 on page 293. Um, um, Right where, um, so, so the title of section 181 is Faith and Knowledge, Glauben und Wissen. Glauben und Wissen. So that's an allusion to Kant. Um, and uh, right as Kant said in the preface to the second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, I had to eliminate this and I had to eliminate knowledge to make room for Glauben, for faith. 
Okay, so, and what Carnap is arguing in that section is that if faith means um, belief that certain things are true, then it can't be outside of science it can't, because um, uh, it, belief, the object of belief is statements that can be true or false, belief in that sense. Um, so it has to be the object of faith in that sense would have to be statements that can be true or false, which therefore fall within the realm of science. But then he says, um, all right, so actually here, here's where he's saying this on page 293. Thus, for example, faith in a certain revelation or in the assertion of a certain person, um, uh, actually, Well, maybe saying, well, so, I mean, faith in a certain revelation or faith in a certain person, if you translate that to faith that the things contained in that revelation are true, faith that the things that person says are true. So thus, for example, faith in a certain revelation or in the assertions of a certain person can, through further investigation, lead to knowledge. For in this case, faith means the same as holding to be true. Okay, actually, so it was what I was saying before, right? So faith in a certain person, meaning believing what they say is true. So it's not in itself knowledge, at least normally not, because uh, um, it's not a sufficient verification of what they say, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, this doesn't have to be a prophet or whatever, you know, if you say to me, I was in that room and there's a table there, that's not how table was introduced by its constructional definition. So at least normally that's not going to be sufficient for me to accept that, um, justify, justifiably assert that as true. So it won't count as knowledge, but through further investigation, it could lead to knowledge. Right? They said something that I do know how to verify. So if I believe them, that can be, I'm now believing something which I can now determine whether I really should believe it or not. But he says, on the other hand, if by faith is meant a certain inner attitude of a person, so, sorry, a certain inner attitude of a person as something which cannot be conceptually formulated, then we are not even within the realm of theory. And the effect of that attitude cannot be called knowledge. Right? So, I mean, and in this sense, he, the, here it's not just alluding to Kant. He's basically agreeing with Kant that faith, why is the realm of faith completely distinct from the realm of knowledge? Why is the realm of Glauben completely distinct from the realm of Wissen? Because faith is a practical and not a theoretical matter. Okay, and... Um, There's another place we've already, it's actually I'm going to go right back to this. There's another place we've already seen Carnap talk about faith and what lies outside the realm of theory and um, inner attitudes. And that is in the preface. So he begins the preface by saying, Right? He says, the, what is the purpose of a scientific book? It is meant to convince the reader of the validity of the thoughts which it presents. That is, I'm trying to convince you that certain statements are true. That's the purpose of a scientific book. Um, it's not the purpose of a book of lyric poetry, to use an example that Carnap uses later and that I think he already has in mind here, 
right? The purpose of a book of lyric poetry, whatever it is, is not to convince you that certain things are true. So if one of the poems says, you know, the plums that were in the refrigerator, I ate, I'm sorry, or wherever that poem goes, right? The point of me reading that is not to be convinced that there are plums and were plums in the refrigerator. <laughs> um, right. So, um, um, but Carnap says, you know, I may have other questions about the book rather than what does the author think is true. And that's what he says he's going to address in the preface. And he says, here, outside the framework of the theory, a brief answer to the second question. And, and I should say what the second question is. The second question is, whence these thoughts came and where they lead, whether there are movements in other areas of inquiry in which they are connected, with which they are connected. Um, so at first you might think, well, that's, you know, okay. So he is saying beyond the realm of the framework of the theory, actually in German, he actually says beyond the framework of theory, right? That is Rolf George inserted that the to make it sound more innocuous than it is. He actually says beyond the framework of theory, right? Outside of the task of convincing you that certain things are true. But still, you might think that second question sounds like a theoretical question still. Where did the, it sounds like a historical question. Where did these thoughts come from, etc. But when you get to the end of the preface, um, well, so first of all, before you get to the end of the preface, um, This is a passage I read before, but now I'm going to read it again. The new type of philosophy has arisen in close contact with the work of the special sciences, especially mathematics and physics. Consequently, they have taken, they meaning the people who practice the new type of philosophy, consequently, they have taken the strict and responsible orientation. Well, orientation you shouldn't be surprised to learn by now, is just a different translation of that same German word, Haltung. Consequently, they have taken the strict and responsible Haltung of the scientific investigator as their guideline for philosophical work. So where do these thoughts come from? Well, they come from uh, having learned a practical lesson from science, as opposed to, I mean, within the realm, the framework of theory, we're also taking certain theoretical lessons from science, right? We're appealing to empirical results. But if you ask outside the realm of theory, where do these thoughts come from? The answer is, well, these thoughts come from learning a practical lesson about responsibility from science. And who hasn't learned that lesson? Well, um, well, you can't see the board right now, but who hasn't learned that lesson is the person who is speaking irresponsibly. That is the person who's doing pseudo theory. That is the metaphysician, <laughs> right? So these thoughts come from having learned our lesson not to be that kind of metaphysician anymore from um, the ethical example of science, basically. Um, and at the very end of the preface, he says, um, um, after saying a lot more about this orientation, which again is Haltung, it is an orientation which demands clarity everywhere. It is an orientation which acknowledges the bonds that tie men together. But at the same time, I'm not going to talk about the sexist language now. Okay. It, it, actually, it isn't really in German because he really says, he says mensch. But that's not, anyway, but, but at the same time, strives for free development of the individual. 
the end of a long list of what this Haltung that we've learned from the, the responsible Haltung of the scientist, what it what its characteristics are. And then he says, our work is carried by the faith that this attitude will win the future. Right? So um So, you know, like going back to the question, what's up with this book? Like what's really important to him? It seems like what's really important to him is this practical lesson. And the book is an expression, although the contents of the book are theoretical. Um, they don't belong to empirical science, but they belong to something that's connected to empirical science, something like mathematics. Um, description of the way a language can be. <laughs> um, the reason for all of that theory is because um, I'm proposing, recommending, as Hume would say, um, um, a certain practical haltung, a certain faith, according to which this language or a language like this should be chosen. Should be chosen for a certain purpose. Again, like to show the hypothetical imperative that if this is your purpose, you should choose this language that belongs to the realm of theory. Right? I want to say that, you know, if you want to be able to reduce all statements about objects to the given, you know, etc., you should choose this form of language. That, again, belongs to some, it's a formal investigation. It's kind of like mathematics. Um, investigation of the properties of a scientific language. Um, but, the, but we're only interested in that, what he's saying in the prefaces. Right? Where does this come from and where does it lead? That is, um, what brought me to expound this theory and what do I hope for from it? Um, the answer is, um, well, what brought me to it and what I hope from for it is practical considerations. I learned to overcome despair and find faith <laughs> in, um, by seeing the example of physical and mathematical scientists. Um, so, um, um, so this is kind of a, this book is kind of a gospel. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, it's the good news that we can get out of the bad metaphysical past if we'll just adopt the responsible attitude. For the, you know, um, if if an, if enough of us adopt it, that it carries the future. Um. Okay, so that's all. Um, Well, actually, so are there questions about that? I know, like, I alluded to various things that obviously, like, you know, Kant's theoretical practical distinction and all kinds of things that aren't, haven't been covered in this course. Some of you had other courses where I talked about them, but so there might be something unclear about that or other questions. Like, are people clear about what the distinction between theoretical and practical that I'm making here is supposed to mean? Yes, <laughs> the two people I can see just gave me thumbs up, <laughs> but I don't know if that's probably not a coincidence. <laughs> the other people who are not don't have your video on. <laughs> Did you have a question about it? All right, I will. I will just go on. But if you think of a question, you should ask. By the way, you know you can ask me questions by email too. I was just reading someone else's syllabus where it said, if you have questions about the course, you have substantive questions, you have to ask me in person. And I, you know, I don't have that rule. Ask me however 
you want to ask me. <laughs> Come to office hours, send me an email, whatever. Um, okay, but um, um, okay, so that's all fine and good uh, as an explanation of like what kind of thing Kant, I mean Kant, Carnap thinks he's doing with this book. Um, and you know, and it's important if what I said is true that the the, the basic project of this book is not um, technical. Um, I mean, either I mean, like either in the kind of usual sense of tech, usual current day sense of technical where it means kind of like mathy or something, <laughs> right? I mean, all the, you know, all those long logistic formulas and whatever, which I didn't ask you to read any of, but I'm sure you can see them by opening the right part of the book. Um, you know, Carnap thinks they're important for some reason, but the reason he's writing the book is not because he thinks that this symbolism is so neat. <laughs> it's the other way around. He thinks the symbolism is neat because of something that's very, very important that he mostly doesn't talk about within the book. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, but it's also, the project of the book is not technical in that sense, but it's also not technical in a more technical sense of technical, <laughs> in like a Kantian sense of technical, right? Where, you know, a technical imperative tells you uh, what means to adopt for some particular end. It's a type of hypothetical imperative, um, right? The other type is what's called the counsels of prudence, which tells you what to do to attain happiness. So the end is, is not well-defined in that case. But a tactical imperative is like, you know, um, if you want uh, to build a bridge that won't fall down, then this is how you should do it. Um, so again, the book contains a technical imperative like that, right? It says, if you want to erect a constructional system that has certain characteristics, this is how you should do it. Um, or maybe even stepping back from that a little bit, if you want to choose a language in which, uh, all the words can be eliminated in favor of a certain fundamental class of words. And in particular, the ones that refer to the immediately given, this is how you should do it. Um, but although that, the book as everything else, other than the preface and a few sections that are marked, uh, maybe skipped, <laughs> and a few of the things at the very end, Everything in the book is all towards that technical project. What he's saying in the preface is, I didn't write the book just because I thought, oh, here's an interesting technical project. Let me see if I can solve it. I wrote the book because I came to the belief or the, the faith that solving this technical, this particular technical project is crucial. Crucial to what? Well, crucial to answering the practical problems of life correctly. That is crucial to ethics. So um, here's one more quote from the end of, from the very end of the book, page 298. Um, So this is in the literature section to the last, to the, to section 183, right? Like, uh, you know, many of the sections I'm sure you've noticed have these literature sections, which are like further reading if you're interested, only the contents of them are often really wild. Like, I mean, you wouldn't know that without looking up these books, but they're, you know, they range all over all kinds of books that were published in Germany in, you know, the um, um, early 20th century. And some of them, are, you know, some of them are like about spiritualism. <laughs> anyway, so 
but so the the last the literature section to the last section is mentions Wittgenstein's Tractatus. <laughs> that's 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 the further reading that might be useful, and he says, um, and this is what he closes the book with. Unfortunately, this treatise has remained almost unknown. In part, it is it is difficult to understand and has not been sufficiently clarified, but it is very valuable, both in its logical derivations, that's the technical part, right? And in the ethical attitude which it shows. And again, that word is haltung. And then this is the last sentence of the Aufbau, except for the summary. <laughs> Wittgenstein summarizes the import of his treatise in the following words. What can be said at all can be said clearly, and whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. Must in what sense? Well, he's implying in an ethical sense. Right? That's, you know, the import of the treatise is the ethical halting which speaks from it, and that's summarized by the, um, it's, uh, both in the preface of the Tractatus or introduction and as the final proposition of the Tractatus, wherever, whereof uh, one can speak at all, one can speak clearly, and whereof one cannot speak, one must keep silent. Did, Avery, did you, were you raising your hand or something? No. So, uh, so, um, That's the ethical halting that Carnap's in agreement with and that he's somehow trying to further in his book, I take it. Um, now the question is why though? I mean, it's a good question for Wittgenstein and the Tractatus, but I know I would hate to try to answer that. <laughs> I've never taught a course on Wittgenstein, and I probably neither, never will. But for Carnap, I think I can say a little bit. So, but the so the question is, like, um, okay, it's a kind of waste. It's kind of waste of time to spend a lot of your life trying to give pseudo answers to pseudo questions. Um, you know, your time could be better occupied. Your time could probably be worse occupied too, right? I mean, you know, I think as Hume says somewhere about this, it's in the introduction to the second inquiry, like, you know, the life of the retired metaphysical scholar is inoffensive, <laughs> right? I mean, at least to all appearances, someone who, uh, you know, and there are people like this now, because I don't, quite share Carnap's view that this is just nonsense, but I do wonder how productive it is. There are people who spend all their lives trying to answer questions like, um, suppose there's two bodies between a surface and a light source, so that if you took away either one of them, the light source would still be blocked. How many shadows are there? And if there's on the surface, and if there's only one shadow, which body is it the shadow of? <laughs> right? Like this is actually a topic that's discussed in philosophical journals, and there's a whole literature on questions like that. Um, so, uh, you know, so someone who's doing that, like, yeah, maybe their time would be better spent if they were curing cancer or something, but, you know, uh, not all of us can do that, and it doesn't seem like they're hurting anyone. <laughs> um, why is there this ethical concern with this type of language is the question. So I think there's Kant in the preface to the uh, B edition gives two answers to this. And I think Carnap also gives both these answers, um, but uh, it's not clear how they're related or which one is more important. So I guess one thing is,
insoluble conflicts. Um, and actually, maybe I'll write both of them before I say what either of them are. Right, so one is insoluble conflict, right? Uh, as Kant says, it's like a scandal to philosophy. Actually, this is more of the emphasis in the preface to the A edition. But anyway, it's a scandal to philosophy that uh, on these metaphysical questions, people just go back and forth and no one ever wins. I think, you know, I remember what I said about when I asked my mathematician friend, you know, in mathematics journals, do people ever publish a paper just to say that there's something wrong with someone else's proof? And his answer was, well, no. I mean, you just tell them that there's something wrong with their proof and they have to fix it. <laughs> or, the, or retract their paper. <laughs> but in, in philosophy journals, um, everything that's happened between Kant and now or between Carnap and now has not changed this. They're still full of disputes that just keep going back and forth. And one side says, there's some, no, there's something wrong with your proof. And the other side says, no, on the contrary, there's something wrong with your proof, that there's something wrong with my proof. And, um, and these things never get, uh, seem to get solved. Well, Kant and Carnap both have a diagnosis here, which is that the reason they can't be solved is that the questions they're asking are bad. And in some sense, at least, we don't know what the question means. We don't know what the answers mean. Um, therefore, the answers don't really conflict with each other. So one is, person is saying one thing and the other is saying the other thing, but neither of them, it, it, there's a pseudo disagreement. They've said what look like two statements, one of which is the negation of the other, but actually neither of them are statements at all. They're not things that can be true or false. And that's the fundamental reason for this insoluble conflict. Now this, if you think conflict is bad, especially insoluble conflict, right? Like the war of all against all or something. If you think that's bad, then this in itself is a practical consideration. It might seem like it's not that strong a practical consideration because after all, it only involves these people shut away in universities. Um, in Kant's time and in Carnap's time, the people shut away within universities who were working on this kind of stuff somehow by way of religion or uh, by way of ideological parties ended up having a lot of influence on the society as a whole, or at least arguably they did. A lot of people thought they did anyway. So uh, possibly we have fixed that by making analytic metaphysics anyway something that no one outside of the university will ever hear about, <laughs> right? I mean, there never is going to be a headline in the New York Times. It's been discovered that there's only one shadow, <laughs> and it's the shadow of the second body, right? No one will ever hear about that. So uh, maybe that's a good thing. Anyway, but at least from Carnap or Kant's point of view, you can't trust this conflict to stay within the university. Eventually, it will get picked up by people outside who barely understand it, but at least they understand enough to know that it's really important to solve this question. Does God exist or not? right, um, is a typical example. Um, so, uh, um, but then here's another reason, which in this case, I think it's easier to see why this might be a really pressing practical problem. And uh, it's the fear that, um, if the if apparent theory extends itself to the answer of questions that are really practical, one of the questions that's really practical as both um, that's really a matter of faith, as both Carnap and Kant say, is the question of free will. 
um, um, you know, am I free to follow the moral law or not? Am I free to adopt the correct ethical attitude or not? Um, and uh, as both Car Carnap and Kant point out, the metaphysicians claim to be able to settle this question theoretically. Um, so uh, even the fact that one of the parties is going to be the one that says, no, you're not free, already, already sounds like an ethical worry. Because even though they're probably going to say up and down, you know, as Spinoza does or whatever, no, no, this doesn't conflict with ethics, it's easy to see how um, people who want to rationalize immoral actions are going to use this type of theory to do it. Right? So people are going to say, well, you know, can't help it. It's my nature to uh, do this, so you can't blame me. I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, so even if that's just one of the schools that's going to be out there, and that's something that people will hear about in the newspaper probably eventually or on some blog or, you know, um, that's a worry, let alone if, as Kant at least thinks, I don't think Carnap thinks this, but, you know, if the nature of theory is automatically going to favor determinism so that that school is going to um, come out winning if you let it make claims. So, um, um, so these are both practical issues that could be involved in um, from Kant's point of view, irresponsible uh, philosophy, irresponsible claims to cognition, um, irresponsible uh, um, claims to understand a question well enough to say that it must have one answer or the or its negation. Um, um, that is, that it's subject to the law of excluded middle. From Carnap's point of view, but this is what makes Carnap much more radical than Kant. Um, it, that it's just, it's irresponsible speech. It's saying things, it's asserting things. Um, that, uh, or at least, let's say, appearing to assert things that can't really be asserted because they're not meaningful. Um, right, or so to put it a little bit differently, according to Kant, there's a distinction between a kind of logical meaning and um, material or objective meaning and the statements of metaphysics have logical meaning. I can say things about them like, if they're true, they can't also be false, but they don't have material or objective meaning that as I can't say what they're about. <laughs> um, so I don't know what it would mean for them to be true or false. So, uh, but um, Carnap, again, wants to be more radical than that and say, these statements appear to have a logical meaning, but they don't. Um, they're just, um, well, they're not just noise, of course. If they were just noise, what could be wrong with them, <laughs> right? If I just walked around saying blah, 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 well, it's kind of annoying, I guess. But other than that, what could be wrong with it? So, uh, um, But what they are is expressions of a certain attitude. Only it's a bad attitude, <laughs> right? Because what attitude is it? Well, it's the attitude that if I make this sound, 
and you make this other sound that differs from mine by putting not in front of it. We disagree with each other, and the disagreement has to be settled. That's the attitude, right? So that's what leads to these conflicts. On the contrary, if a poet or a mythologist or whatever you call someone who speaks in the mode of myth, right, um, says some sentence, it might be the same sentence the metaphysician said. And probably not. Later on, Carnap says that metaphysics is bad poetry. He says that as part of criticizing Heidegger's early work. And Heidegger seems to agree because Heidegger's later work sounds much more poetic. And he even starts writing poetry. <laughs> but anyway, never mind that. So, you know, so it might be the exact same sentence, right? Like it might be uh, Zeus is angry. If we imagine like a really kind of uh, old time pre-Socratic metaphysician or pre-pre-Socratic metaphysician and their thesis is, you know, um, everything happens in the world because of what Zeus wants. So, uh, you know, maybe when Homer says that, Homer's not a lyric poet, but let's say close enough. When Homer says that, um, uh, when Homer says that, as he does in some place, that um, Zeus pushes the waves ashore. <laughs> um, you know, does that mean that if I say, no, Zeus was in Ethiopia celebrating a feast, <laughs> which Homer also says somewhere, that we disagree with each other? <laughs> Well, so, and the answer is, if it's poetry or myth, no. <laughs> but if it's metaphysics, yes. <laughs> we disagree with each other. And then we have to, might have to fight a war about it. Right? And if you think that's extreme, remember how many wars were fought about stuff like, you know, is the body of Christ really in this wafer or not? That's a paradigmatic case of metaphysics, what Carnap is calling metaphysics. Um, the whole point is that you can't tell empirically whether the body of Christ is in the way or not. So, uh, um, so, so yeah, so one problem is it leads to insoluble conflict, but the, so, and Carnap says that pretty explicitly at various places in the book, including in the preface. Right? One of the things he says in the preface is that, unfortunately, philosophy presents the spectacle, which is depressing to someone who's used to science, responsible scientific writing. It presents the spectacle of one person after another erecting a whole system and the next person tearing it down and starting over. Right? That is basically no one's making any progress because no one can prove anyone else was wrong. Um, so, but the other thing, well, he doesn't mention this so explicitly that that's what he's worried about, but I think that, um, if you look at the set of metaphysical pseudo problems that he addresses in the last part of the book, you can see that they're basically, um, Kant's type of they're basically the same problems or closely related to problems that Kant addresses in the antinomy or and or that he addresses in his practical philosophy, like in the second critique. So, you know, one of them is the question of causality and causal determinism versus free will. But another is soul body dualism. Right? Is the subject of psychology the same or different than the subject of biology, let's say? Um, another is the reality of the world of experience. Right? Even after I've collected all the historical evidence that the Trojan War really happened, someone comes along and asks a metaphysical question. But is what your evidence shows that 
there was a real Trojan War or that the Trojan War is constructed in your consciousness? That's, that's the metaphysical question. Um, and finally, the question of death, the riddle of death, right? That is, is there a future life might be one way of posing the riddle of death. So those are the questions that Carnap wants to rule out as metaphysical, and those are the exact questions that Kant wants to say lie outside the bounds of theoretical cognition. Um, <laughs> okay, there were bunch, there have been a bunch of comments that I didn't notice about. That's a big jump. That escalated pretty fast. Yes, well, you know, I'm over time now, so it escalated none too fast. <laughs> All right, so I will see you next week.